As you know, in the Quran, many of the surahs they are in pairs. Surah Rahman and Surah Waqi'ah they are also in pairs. The difference is in Surah Rahman, Allah's tone and tone is very nice, very gentle, comparative. Allah says, I did this for you and I did this for you. Which of my favorites will you deny? But in Surah Waqi'ah, the tone is, Antum, uh, uh, did you do this or did I do this? Did you do this or did I do this? The tone in Surah Waqi'ah is very different. Very, a little bit more, you can say, harsh. Now, in the beginning, I want to mention that Surah Rahman, the Prophet has called it a Rusul Quran, which is that it is the bride of Quran. And this Surah is very important because the name of Allah, Ar Rahman, this was unknown to the Arabs. You know, they have one God, you have the Kaaba, and around the Kaaba you have many idols. So they also believed in one God, but they also believed in these idols. Why? Because they believed in that there is a God, but He's like a dictator. This is also the concept that a lot of times we hold in our belief system. That Allah is there, but you know, and he's, he's just looking to bring me down. Or Allah is there, but He's like a dictator. Or He, he wants to find a reason to bring me down in the Day of Judgment. So this type of attitude. To re rectify this opinion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Himself a name introducing himself as Ar-Rahman. So when this surah was revealed, the people of the Quraysh said, who is this Rahman? Who is Ar-Rahman? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in Surah Bani Israel, Rahman, You call him Allah, you call him Ar-Rahman. Whichever that you call him by, he is Ar-Rahman. He, for him is all the beautiful names. So I just want to clarify that either there is no God, then your life is meaningless. And if there is a God, but he's a dictator, then you've got another problem. But the concept that Qur'an wants to give is that no, he's Allah, he's merciful. You see only a portion of his mercy in this life, and you're going to see a lot more in the life that is going to come. Now this surah is very interesting. It has a lot of uh, scientific aspects. So the Waqi'a also mentions the black holes, which I will be talking about that when we get to that ayah. Now, <coughs> Now for Rahma, Rahma, just so you understand this word Rahma, just quickly because I want to do a quick tafsir. tafsir. Rahma, Ar-Rahman, and Ar-Rahim. The name of Allah, most of them are on the weight of Rahim. Kareem, Jameel, Qadir, Aleem. When it's all of these at this weight, it means forever and ever. But Ar-Rahman is Rahma, the same Rahama. And by the way, Irham means relationships, because relationships are merciful. Or Irham, meaning the same root word, is the womb of the mother that nourishes the child into existence. So for this should give you some example, idea of what Rahmah is. Rahmah is, but that mercy of Allah that's continuous and forever and ever, that's Rahim. He's Ar Rahim. His mercy is forever. Ar Rahman is passionate, spontaneous. It is... Uh, it is like uh, like a, a tornado that just comes and then leaps. It's like uh, it's very fast. It's very quick. It's very passionate. It's very emotional. So all the words in Arabic that are of this weight, like Ar Rahman, Atshan, he's thirsty. Atish, thirsty. Atshan, very thirsty. Cannot be more thirsty than this. Ghadban, Ghadab, angry. Ghadban, most. He cannot be more angry. Than so Ar-Rahman, he cannot be more merciful than this. It can, he cannot manifest his more mercy more than this. Which is what? Ar-Rahmanu Allah al quran That compassion of his, that mercy of his, that when it manifested itself, how did it manifest itself? Allah al quran he taught Qur'an. So Ar-Rahman, out of all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest name, the greatest need, that human beings have in terms of what we need from Allah is His Rahmah, His mercy. So Ar-Rahman, 
these four ayat, they are in a sense the pink of the Quran. So Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, not just most merciful, but passionately merciful, emotionally merciful. Allah al-Qur'an, the greatest gift he gave to human beings. Khalaq al-Insan, he created human beings. He created his best creation and gave them the Qur'an. Allah al-Bayan, and he gave him the power of speech. The largest area of the human brain is the speech center. So that gift of speech, which separates us essentially from animals, because there's animals that are faster, they smell better, they see better, so, but our ability to do bayan and mubayyan. Mubayyan is an internal thing where we make things dissimilar. We can categorize and distinguish things. Like you know you, were, you use the word mubayyan clear. So bayan also means to make things clear. Bayan also means to make speech. So he gave you Quran so that you will teach it. And this is his greatest gift that is given humanity. So ar-Rahman mu'allam al-Quran. And not only that, then the Quran is meaningful. Why? Because of all because the Quran is the word of Allah, right? And the work of Allah, which is the creation around us, is also the word of Allah. Allah said, be and it is. This whole universe is like a book. The sun, the stars, the moon, these are all words of Allah that have come into existence. So here's the word of Allah, and there is the word of Allah. They're both. The creation is the word of Allah. Allah said, be, and it was. So this is also the word of Allah. This is the relationship. So when you read Quran, Quran is, very interestingly enough, always pointing to history, or pointing to this creation, or pointing to that. Now, Allah says, الشمس والقمر بخسبان The sun and the moon, they are following their calculated, precisely calculated orbits. They are precisely following their calculated paths. Husban. You know hisab? The Urdu word hisab? Hasab. Hisab means calculation. So the sun is moving in a calculated way, which we know today. And the moon is also moving in a calculated way, which we also know today. If somebody wants to tell us what the phase the moon will be in 10 days from now, we can calculate it now. So the sun is also moving, the moon is also moving. Thank you. And the stars and the trees, they are in prostration to Allah. This can mean two things. One is that they're literally in prostration in some shape or form. Or that they're following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, one, the bayan with Qur'an, right? Number two, the sun and the moon following their calculated orbits. Now these are scientifically aspects that are just in the beginning. Now what's about to come next, you would imagine, what does the Bedouin have to do with the next topic? Meaning a person in Arabia, why would he even mention this? It's almost like it was made for today's world. الشمس والقمر بأسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان The sky, we have raised it and placed in it in balance. So the sky, or this earth that we have, it runs on a balance, which we know has to do with the environment today, which will become clear. So this universe, Allah has made it into a balance. وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا The sky, we have raised it. وَوَدَعَ And we placed in it الْمِزَانِ The mizan. أَلَّا تَطْغُوا فِي الْمِزَانِ Look, don't disturb this balance. This balance that Allah has created, don't disturb it. وَأَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ وَلَا تُخْصِرُ الْمِزَانِ and establish the weight, the wasn, the weight of things, the way things should be done with justice. Wala tuqsirun mizan, and don't fall short on the on the balance of scales of things. Now this opens up a lot of doors with a lot of conversations with in terms of Islam and how Islam sees the environment and and the direction in which technology is going in, whether if it would be Islamically correct or not Islamically correct, all these issues would open up, which I'm not going to go into right now. وَأَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِيزَانِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَدَعَهَا لِلْأَنْعَامِ Now Allah is mentioning this, why? These are all manifestations of Allah's mercy. The sun, the moon, the, the environment, the way it is, 
you know, uh, suitable for life, and can, not only suitable for life, but suitable for growth of civilization, for the full potential of human civilization. And then, And in the earth he has placed cattle. An'am could mean any living thing, but specifically cattle. Uh, creatures, an'am means any creature. Okay? So he's placed creatures in here. And they are in the in effect running, helping run this whole earth, the sustainability of the earth, the ecosystem of the earth. So on and so forth. We have uh, now. Also, there is fruits in there. Now, who benefits from all these things? Who benefits from the creatures? Who benefits from the domestic animals? Who benefits from the sky and the earth and all? The, who is, it's almost as if the whole earth is serving them. So this is the Quranic argument. Actually, it's that. Allah doesn't argue if He exists or not. But He's like, if you look at the universe, why do you think the whole universe is so suitable to you? Not only suitable to you, but perfect for your human potential. This, I mean, you dig the earth, the oil, the minerals, the copper, everything that comes out is suitable for human potential, for human civilization to reach its peak. So everything in, in, the, in this earth that is designed, it's almost as in ser serving them. When the fruits come out, who, who uses them? You know, human beings use them. Even animals are not able to use them to the degree that we use them. And then, <coughs> so, وَالْأَرْضَ وَدَعَاهَا لِلْأَنَامِ فِيهَا فَاكِهَةٌ وَنَحْنُ ذَاتُ الْأَكْمَامِ And then not only that, the fruits are there, but look at even the trees, how beautifully they're designed. Look at the date palm tree. How it's made, how it's deep, it's rooted, and how strong it looks, and how the shape of the palm tree is, how beautiful it is. And then there's the seed, and around the seed is the husk. You know, the, the, the chinka is like the So there's the seed, and then there's that thing that protects the seed even. I mean, this, this delicate system that Allah had, this is all manifestations of His mercy. If these uh, chinkas were not there, the husk wasn't there, many of the grains that you would have, they would go to waste. The bugs would eat them. The only reason the bugs don't get to them is because the husk is there. So all this is by accident? You don't see the mercy? If you don't see the mercy of Allah, this is a very unfortunate thing if people live in a way that they don't see the mercy. It's one thing to come to... Nowadays the problem is people don't believe in Allah. So if you come to believe in Allah, then there's another step actually. Because for us modern minds, we think, okay, if there's a God, He must be some sort of dictator. This is because modern minds have been built to think against authority of any shape or any form. So you... You, you, every government's bad in the modern mind, every adult is bad, every parent is bad, everything. So anyway, this is just a part of the mechanism of how the modern mind works. Anyway, not only that, then how about this, the scent, the beautiful scent, the good scent that these flowers have, these fruits have, they have good scent. If, if, and you know, it's just by nature that when a fruit goes bad, it also smells bad. When things go bad, they smell bad. And then, how is all these things just perfectly suited for human beings? So, فِيهَا فَاكِهَةٌ وَنَخْلُ ذَاتُ الْأَكْمَامُ وَالْحَفْظُ الْأَسْفِ وَالْرَيْحَانُ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تَكْرِمَانُ The single most repeated verse in the Qur'an is this. Ala means bounties, favors, and also power. Both. Ala means power, bounties, both. Favors of Allah, the bounties of Allah. So it can be used in the sense of Allah's favors, but it can also be used in the sense of Allah's power. How can you deny Allah's power? So, So which of your Lord's favors will you deny? Then, This ayah is very and we created man from a clay-like pottery. What does that mean? We, there are seven words used in Quran for the creation of man. I'm not going to go into the details of this right now. But we, the two basic ones is clean, or actually turab. Turab is dust. Then ma, water. Turab is when water and dust have been put together and it becomes like clay. Okay, that's theme. When water and clay come together, water and dust come together, it becomes clean. When it has been further developed into like a pottery, has been, been given a shape, this is salsalin kal There are seven words in Quran, I just introduced three or four. 
So, and we created man from pottery-like clay. So this thing, you know, even if you take the evolutionary process, okay, so we were, we know water, life came from water, and then it moved towards land, and so on and so forth. So this, but from there, developing it to a human being, this process, this process, this cannot have happened except without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man being at the peak of Allah's creation, or at, if you look at it the other way, the peak of evolution, this didn't happen by chance, according to Quran. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَنْصَالٍ كَالْفَخَّارِ وَخَلَقَ الْجَانَ مِنْ مَالِ جِمِّنَّا And he created jinns from uh, a, uh, the smokeless flame of a fire. If you ever heard about the Bunsen burner, the Bunsen burners, okay, so the Bunsen burner has that, that flame that's the hottest part, that's smokeless, is the one that's invisible. So that's why the shayateen, you cannot see them because that part of the flame that they're made of is also invisible. And this is, and so also answers the question, okay, why we can't see the jinns? Well, because they're made of something that is unseeable. And uh, maybe in the future there might be some technology by which we can maybe detect them a little bit. Allah Fabi So which of your Lord's favors or powers do you deny? That you were nothing, you didn't exist. Humanity was nothing. Humanity is just a, a very small footnote in the entire history of the universe. So which of your Lord's favors do you deny? Rabbul Mashriqayn wa Rabbul Mahlubayn. He is the Lord of the East and the West. I won't go into the details of this, but seasons, all the different seasons that take place, they take place by the rising in the sun of different uh, end points. So the, the end point of the two Easts, the two extremes, and then the two Wests. So Rabbul Mashriqayn wa Rabbul Mahlubayn, this changing of the weather and the and the coming of the season where the plants grow and they reach their zenith and then after that fall comes and then they go away. So this whole thing, then when summer and winter, this whole uh, system that's in place, this is all not by accident. That's the merciful Allah. This is Allah's mercy at work. Imagine if we all lived under the same weather all the time. A lot of things couldn't, a lot of men, mercies wouldn't manifest themselves. Now here is another scientific point. So far, the human brain being used for speech, one. The movement of the sun and the moon and being exactly calculated, number two. Okay. Then, uh, the balance and the environment having a balance, number three. Now number four is this. <clears throat> Allah says Marajan And that point where two oceans meet Between them is a barrier They don't transgress And this happens in many shapes and forms One is the salt water is running And the fresh water is running And they're running side by side And this doesn't go into this And this doesn't go into this But what's interesting is that For life For life Life can only come from fresh water, not salt water. And if there was water on earth before life, it would have had to be salt water, not fresh water. So there had to be some process in place to create fresh water. This is another point. So you have seen those rivers where salt is on one side, fresh water is on the other side. But it also happens in other shapes and forms. For example, there is uh, salt water is heavier. Salt water is running under the currents. Side by side, and the fresh water is on top. So there, so instead of being this way, or uh, in, in, you know, on the one on this side and the other on this side, and this we have observed many times, all of us maybe. But actually, now there are like two, three other ways this manifests itself. There is this river I forget uh, in somewhere in the um, south, you know, where people go for vacation, where there is the fresh water on top, and then when you dive deep, then from there the person's in fresh water. Fishing in the salt water. He's in scuba diving, in diving gear. He goes to the bottom of the fresh water on, right before the salt water begins. And he's fishing for salt water fish from where the salt water is. So this has many meanings in that sense. Marad al Bahraini al Tatiyan and that place where the salt water and the fresh water or the two rivers they meet, however they meet. 
By the way, that points where the salt water and the fresh water meet is also from the perspective of ecosystems. Very important, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So, which of your Lord's mercies or which of your Lord's powers or favors can you deny? Now, he did this. He did all of this for who? He did all of this for man. Why? Because only man can appreciate it. Can a river of salt water appreciate itself? No. Can a fresh water appreciate itself? Can a beautiful flower appreciate itself? Can a fruit appreciate itself? No. Only man will say it. Oh, subhanAllah, this is what Allah did. Only man can see the universe and observe the universe and, and actually appreciate Allah. This is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allah said, I was a hidden treasure. And I, I was a hidden treasure. I wanted to be known. I created man. Because only man can appreciate the, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A flower doesn't know that it's beautiful. So all these different fruits that you see, this is just the preface of what you're going to get in the next life. So this is just to know that there... So anyway, so يَخْرُجُ مِنْهُمَ الْلُؤْلُؤُ وَالْمَرْجَانِ And then Allah... Uh, then Allah says, then in that same oceans, the same seas, when you dive deep, you can get pearls and corals and all these different things. Even in the depths of seas, there are things for humanity. I Meaning even in the darkness, for which Allah says in another place, they are so dark, those places, his, he would not see his own hand in that darkness of the oceans. By the way, somebody became Muslim reading that verse because... How did Muhammad وسلم, know that when you go deep in the ocean that it's so dark you can't even see your hands? So the Quran says that when you're in the depths of the ocean, when you can't even when you can't even see your hands, there's still jewels and treasures for humanity to take out of earth. And by the way, and this is another thing that I will share with you. The earth will last as long as the earth can sustain human beings. Meaning, obviously, when the resources are gone, then the earth has no purpose of existence. This is mentioned in Surah You have istikrar there, you have some time, transitory time on earth. Ilahim, till a certain time. After that, all the treasures that I would have put on earth, they would come to a point that it will be unsustainable to sustain humanity. We're already coming to a point where oil is almost on the verge of its end. And, you know, so obviously the way we are treating the earth and that balance, the balance that we read about in the beginning, because we are living in the earth as students of the earth in a way that is not conducive for the earth itself. So things are on its way very quickly to uh, its end, you can say. Allah says, marjan." Even in the depths of the oceans, I have pearls and coral reefs. Not only that you will be able to buy and trade, which Quran mentions, but you will be able to observe Allah's beauty even at the, at the ends of the earth, in the most... You would think, why would Allah have jewels for me to see and appreciate it, even in the depths of the ocean, but Allah says, I do. Now notice this. This is a question you have to ask yourself. Which of your Lord's favors do you deny? If Allah did this just in general, then... Think of how much more as a human being, as being his best and top creation. Right? These are not his top creations. These are all being made to serve you. Then think about what Allah has done for you. The mind he's given you, the opportunities he's given you, the blessings he's given you. It, it's unfortunate how we start uh, complaining to Allah or feeling like we, we want to complain to Allah. Sometimes because we don't realize Allah's mercy. We're impatient. We're impatient. And to him belong the ships. Meaning the ships, again, is another thing. You know, the water is a very strange uh, entity. Because, why? For a few reasons. Number one, uh, something of... You know, if it's high density, in density, it goes into the earth. But what I want to mention here is that when the ice, when the water becomes cold, it becomes ice. When the water becomes even colder, it becomes, you know? When the water 
becomes cold, zero degrees. It becomes ice. When it becomes even colder, minus 15 degrees, minus 25 degrees, what happens? Water again. It becomes water again. You know why? Because that's what would keep the fishes alive. Otherwise, the ice would keep building underneath until it reaches the bottom. This is why Antarctica doesn't go all the way to the bottom. You can go under Antarctica, if you've ever seen the videos. Because when it's actually colder under, it's colder under the Antarctica. Because it's more, when the water becomes more cold, it becomes water. So it, when the water becomes cold, it becomes ice. And when it becomes more cold, it becomes water. And if that was not the case, we wouldn't be able to have things like fish and these things. And if the water got cold, that, was, that would be the end of uh, vegetation or, or food in that area, wherever that would be. So anyway, <clears throat> the point is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed even you need, for the full, what I call the full content, potential of humanity, that you, we're able to, able to go with large vessels here and there and trade, and the water is like, you know, just a large desert in a sense that we travel. And this is by the favor of Allah. Of course, everything happens with hardship. It doesn't say it doesn't happen with hardship, but it happens. Allah says, see these ships that are traveling as if they're like small hilltops or as if they're small mountains traveling by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So which of your Lord's favors do you deny? The, the end story is, Allah does, when Allah does anything, He does it perfect. But it has to come to an end. He created this, what we see as a perfect world. And it will come to an end. All that are on this earth will come, all that is on this earth will come to an end. Everything has to end. All that is on the... Now notice, alayha here is specifically for earth. Because a lot of people think the whole universe will finish. No. The whole universe will not finish. Only earth will finish. The sun and the moon will collide into one another. This solar system will come to an end. But the rest of the system will stay in its place. Only this solar system that we have, our sun, our moon, this will collide into one another and will come to an end. And then from there something else will happen. And nothing will remain just as before creation, there was nothing but Allah. He was first. Just And just like that, after creation, nothing will remain except Allah. And nothing will remain except for the face and the glory of your Lord, who is Jalal, majesty, and wal ikram, and very noble and generous. Then after that moment where the earth, everybody can agree the earth is going to come to an end sometime. Even the scientific mind will agree that yes, the earth has to come to an end. Whether it is through an asteroid that accidentally hits the earth. And it's, you know, uh, over here I'll share something with you. Do you know why the earth has not been hit by asteroids? You ever look at the moon? How messed up it looks? What? So you know that because if the moon has been hit by asteroids, then you know we're in the path of something. Why do you think the earth has not been hit by asteroids? Because behind Mars, there's another planet. Which one? That is so big and has so much gravitational pull that any time and anything, any object is coming towards Earth, Jupiter, I think it is, or no, it's Saturn. The Jupiter, Jupiter sucks in anything going towards Earth. So it's almost like the Earth has its own batter. You know, and there was an asteroid coming towards Earth, I think about like uh, 10 years ago. But when it reached Jupiter, automatically the atmosphere pulled it in. And they actually took the NASA photos of the moment of the collision between Jupiter and that asteroid, it's, meaning it's, it's documented. So anytime an asteroid is coming towards Earth, Jupiter will suck it in. This is what's been happening so far. But who knows? Uh, we know that when the dinosaurs were here, there was an asteroid that hit the Earth and then Earth, the creation came to an end, basically, after that. And then from there, a new creation started. He's the one who starts creation and then repeats it. 
So, this is the end of you and me and everyone and everything on earth. This earth will come to an end. Nothing will remain except for Allah who is the one full of Jalal and Ikram and uh, full of honor. Karam means uh, honor. So which of your Lord's favors do you deny? Or over here it will be translated rather as which of your Lord's powers do you deny? So over here now, so far what has happened? Allah has discussed, look, I made you, I gave you the Qur'an, look at my nature, I put everything in your control. And this is a very important part of Qur'anic uh, thought. I have put everything under your control. He has created for you whatever is on earth is for you. He's put in your control whatever is in the heaven and the earth. It's, it's for you, it's for your service. It's open to you, go. So, but this will come to an end. This life will come to an end. So which of your Lord's powers do you deny? Yes, now here are some philosophical points for makes, but I'm not going to go into the details of that because then it will become too late. And a lot of scholars have said a lot about the following uh, few verses, but I'm not going to go into details of that. Yes, Look, everything in the heavens and the earth, whatever it is, whatever creature it is, whatever living thing is, it asks a lot, it needs a lot. Every tree needs Allah, every ant needs Allah, every blind lizard in the depths of the ocean needs Allah. Allah is feeding them all. We don't realize this. Human poverty happens for many reasons, but look at the animal world. You ever see a bird starve, or an ant starve, or a creature starve, or a bee starve? Or here in the news, oh, all, the, all of these specific species are going to become extinct because they're starving? No. It's because human beings are... We live in the age of what they call the age of extinction, by the way. Uh, what some sociologists have called the age of extinction. But things are not becoming extinct because of lack of resources, or lack of food, or lack of... It's the human actions that then come back and bite us in the end. But anyway, yes, man fis samawati wal ard. You know, there was, uh, just to share with you, um, this is actually, uh, there was a brother, you know, he was uh, nailing things. So he nailed something. When he was nailing it, he put a nail through a, a lizard. So now the lizard stuck there, right? So now, when they, after many years, opened it up and they saw, oh, there's a lizard that's stuck there and it's alive. How has it been alive for 10 years? Meaning it's been there for so long, I don't know the exact dates, I'm mean, just making hypothetical, but it was, you know, you, you, you build something and, and then you take it off, it must have been some time. And they see a lizard that's through that nail, and they're like wondering, like, how is this lizard alive? It should be dead. So they wanted to see, and they were waiting. And then they saw that every day another lizard comes and feeds this lizard its food, and then goes away. It brings it its food and goes away. Even, you know, we, we don't realize, you know, because evolution pa paints this picture about life being survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest. And we talk about how animals, you know, the strong animal eats the weaker animal and this type of concept of survival of the fittest. But we don't talk about altruism in nature. That there is, a, there's actually, this is documented, that there will be like a lioness who, a bunch of lions that attacked bamboos, like, uh, what are they called, the monkeys? The, the, not chimpanzees, bits. Bamboos, bamboos, right? Bamboos. 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 Okay, so some animal. <laughs> Right? That belong to the primate. Uh, so the lioness and a group of lionesses attack these baboons. And so then the lion, one of the lionesses notices this young, small little creature, like the baboon. And he, she takes her and takes care of her. And then the, the tribe of the baboon thinks, okay, how are we going to get our kid back? Right? So then they. They create like some interference so they, all the lions go over there. But she was trying to protect that little creature that she would normally eat. Same thing like there, there are pictures of a crocodile that normally eats turtles. But it takes a baby crocodile in its mouth and takes it to the 
ocean, or like to this, into the uh, where the water is, to let it go. So there's a lot of altruism, a lot of taking care. Species, species that are not related to each other, taking care of each other. Also, it's not just one side is survival of the fittest, of course. But even when animals eat, they don't eat like the way human beings do. They, they, a lion when it kills, it only kills to satisfy its hunger. It doesn't kill for the sake of killing. It doesn't kill because the way the human beings kill. It says, well, I just have this much hunger, I have to kill for hunger, and that's it. It doesn't go beyond that. But there's a lot of altruism that happens in nature also. So, <clears throat> the point is, yes, whatever is in the heavens and the earth, you and all the creatures, Allah is providing for you. You know, Isa he has a very beautiful saying, which the Prophet has a similar saying to this. That the Prophet said, uh, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam said, Do you not see the birds? How they go out in the morning, they have empty stomachs. And you know what? The animals are not like human beings, where they, there are some that do this. They store something for the winter, like ants do, the bears do. You know, those that hibernate and stuff. They'll st but most animals don't, don't save for the next day. Most animals live day to day to day, and Allah provides them day to day to day to day. So, uh, so anyway, so yes, um, So the Prophet Isa said, "Do you not see the birds how they have empty stomachs in the morning, and they go out, and when they come back, they have their their bellies are full. I mean, they have food for their children. Do you not see this? Why do you not trust Allah?" Why do you not believe Allah will provide for you? And this is one of the things, is that because if we think Allah is a dictator, we think Allah is not going to open up His mercy for us. This is a very wrong attitude. You have to trust in Allah. Allah is like a friend. He's never going to forsake you. He can never forsake you. Never. I mean, things don't happen as we... You know, Ali radiallahu anhu, when he said, I, knew, I know Allah exists because things don't go the way I planned it. His meaning is that I am smart as a human being and I have a certain plan and I can make things work. But even then, if things don't happen, there must be an Allah. So he said, I know Allah exists because things don't happen the way I want it. But the point is, Allah would never forsake, you know, never forsake us. It's impossible. It's impossible that Allah would forsake us. In fact, we should feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like our best friend. Or we should not like our best friend, but we should feel He is our friend. And uh, I can, anyway, uh, just finish here. Yes, man fi samawati wal ard asks him whatever is in the earth, heavens and the earth, it asks him, whether knowingly or unknowingly, everything is yes alu. And it can also mean philosophical questions. Everybody has questions for Allah. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? You can also refer to that. But I said this is a deep ayah, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Yes, man fi samawati wal ard whatever is in this heavens, and remember, Allah didn't just say earth, he also said this. Not just sama. Samawat, all of the creatures and all of the all of the angels and all the creatures and the earth. Every day, yom doesn't mean day like day and night, twenty four hours, but in every phase, every moment, you can say. Some people have said every moment. The way I'll explain this a little bit, so that uh, I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to explain a little bit of what some scholars have said about this eye. At any moment, from one moment to the next moment, there's some change. Right? From one moment to the next moment, there's what? Some change. That, every moment that requires any change needs a fresh kun be from Allah for it to happen. So at every moment, Allah is saying be. Or Allah gives it permission to be. Now there's a difference of opinion among scholars that is it Allah that's doing this or Allah has created a system that's doing this. This I don't want to go into details of that. But the point is that every moment Allah is in a new state of glory. He is in a new state of majesty, a new state of beauty, the way things are going. Yes, man fi samawati wal ard. You don't think he provides for you? Every day he's in a new state of glory. So which of your Lord's powers do you deny? You know, this is when we, are, we, we will free ourselves for you. 
لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ All you two weights of the earth, meaning the, in the human being and the jinn. Allah says, I will turn towards you. After this is all ended, then I'm going to turn towards you and bring you out. سَنَفْرُوهُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Now on that, this ayah, now over here I want to explain something very important. In Qur'an there's ta'wilul an and ta'wilul khas. Ta'wilul an is to explain things in its general terms without keeping anything in the background in mind. And ta'wilul an could be related to the ayahs before it or the ayahs after it or just maybe taking that ayah alone. Just taking that ayah alone out of its context and focusing on it. So when you take an ayah out of its context and just focus on it, it will have a different meaning than when you put it in its context. I'll give you an example here now of this. And both are correct. Both are correct to do. You can take an ayah out of its context and focus on it and come up with a meaning. That is correct. Or you can keep an ayah within its context of the, of the verses before and the verses after. And that is also correct. So Allah says, Ya ma'ashir al-jinni wal-insi Oh, you assemblies of jinn and ins. In istata'atum an tanfuzu If you have the power that you can leave. Min attar al-samawati wal-art From the regions beyond the heavens and the earth. Meaning, what is the point of saying this in this context now? Not out of context, but in the context. It means, you're going to die, you think you can escape Allah? You can escape your, your, your accountability in front of Allah? No. You think you can escape? You won't be able to escape. يَا مَا عَشْرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْزِينِ اسْتَدَعْتُمْ أَن تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ O assembly of jinns and mankind. If you're able to pass beyond the regions of the heaven and the earth, then go ahead, pass. لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِسُلْطَانِ You can't except without a great authority, meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is in the context. It's saying, you think you want to escape, you won't be able to escape. You will have to face Allah on the Day of Judgment. And you will have to have a final destiny of either here or there. Shaykh Sayyid Nusri Rahmatullah he was from Turkey, he was a great scholar of Islam, and he wrote a great tafsir. He explains this, I'll just share this with you in a very interesting way. He says that if you're going somewhere, and you have two choices, you go right or you go left. But you have, you're told if you go right, well, if you go right, you have to join the military, be part of the government, serve in the army. You have to do whatever they tell you to do. And, but they will take care of your rations. They'll give you protection. They will give you the food. They'll give you a place to live. They'll take care of you, but you have to do what they want. But if you go left, you have freedom to do whatever you want. There's no government. But you have to fend for yourself. The wilderness, the creatures that are there, the beasts that are there, the snakes and all of that. You go there, it's up to you, but there's no, no one to protect you, but you have your freedom. You can do whatever you want. You're not answerable to anyone. So now you have to choose. So, Sheikh Sayyid Nusin is tafsir because he likes to, you know, uh, make things more clear. So he talks about one person who goes to the right and one person who goes to the left. So the person that was in the wilderness, at first he was enjoying himself, he was thinking, well, look at the freedom I have, how great life I have. But then slowly what happened? One day, spontaneously, one beast came, caused him one problem. Then another time, another problem came in. And he was really wishing, I wish, you know, I had some sort of protection. Then the person who went to the right, he was thinking, you know, I don't know if I made the right decision. You know, joining here, maybe I should have gone to the left, I would have had my freedom. But he's in the government, but he also soon realizes, I mean, as this tafsir goes on, that, you know, this was the right decision to go on the right side. You have to do something. You have rules to follow, obviously, but then you also get something back in return. Anyway, يَا مَا عَشْرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْزِينِ اسْتَتَعْتُمْ أَن تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَانْفُذُوا Oh, oh, you assembly of jinn and men, men and jinn. إِنْ اسْتَتَعْتُمْ أَن تَنْفُذُوا If you have the ability to pass, مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ From the region of the heavens and the earth فَانْفُذُوا Then go ahead, go. لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِسُلْطَانِ You can never leave without authority from Allah. 
Now, if you take this ayah out of context, meaning it, it doesn't have anything to do with the Day of Judgment, it's just an ayah in itself. This is a very interesting ayah because this is saying, go, you know, you ever watch Star Wars? Uh, not Star Wars, uh, Star Trek. Do you know what it says in the beginning of Star Trek? Human, something like human beings trying to pass the frontiers of the universe. You know, go. Allah is saying go. And in fact, this ayah, without its context, in the Muslim, in the Muslim Khilafah at one time, there was a young man. He he made the first attempt to fly, based upon this ayah. This ayah was his inspiration. He made some wings, and he gathered the whole town. This is actually a true story. I'm telling you a true story. It's not like some fantasy thing. He he made wings and everything, and he gathered the members of the town. Okay, you know, I'm going to uh, fly, and he was gonna jump off the cliff, and they said, oh, come on, man, don't do this. He's like, what's the most that'll happen? I'll break a few bones. <laughs> right? So he jumps off the cliff and breaks a few bones. So, but the inspiration there of human, human beings fly, go, 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 is there. يَا مَعْشَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ نِسْتَتَعْتُمْ أَنْ تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْعُرْضِ فَانْفُذُوا لَا تَنْفُذُونَ إِلَّا بِالْسُلْطَانِ O company of jinn and mankind, if you are able to pass beyond the regions and the zones of the heavens and the earth, then go. You can't pass without authority from Allah. فَبِأَيِّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمْ أَتْكَذِبًا So which of His powers do you deny? You know you can't escape Him. If you believe in Him, you know you can't escape Him. So then what are you doing? Why are you not accepting His mercy? Why are you not turning towards Him? If you know there's no escape, then what are you doing? يُرْسَلْ وَعَلَيْكُمْ أَشْوَاذٌ مِّنْ نَارٍ وَنُحَاسٌ فَلَا تَنْتَصِرُونَ And if you even do try to escape, what will happen? He will send upon you flames of fire and uh, smoke. Smoke to choke you and fire to burn you. If you even try on the Day of Judgment to escape, fire is going to come on you and smoke is going to come on you. فَلَا تَنْتَصِرُونَ Then you will find no one to help you. You'll be all helpless. So which of your Lord's favors do you deny? Now here is a very interesting, another very interesting item. I don't know if any of you have seen those pictures of the universe where they show like a, a, a galaxy that's like pink, like rose, rose red, like reddish, and it's like kind of exploded. Do you, do you know, have you ever seen those pictures? This is the exact picture that's being painted here, very close to that. That when this, you know, crash happens, in our solar system, when the sun and the moon collide between each other, obviously it's going to spark some sort of uh, uh, astrological uh, phenomenon that will happen. That phenomenon or that picture of when that happens is being painted here. And when the, the heaven, the sky, is, is split open and becomes rose colored like oil. You know that you've seen those, like it's like uh, oil, uh, oily, it's actually gaseous state. But it, I mean, from looking at it, it looks like oil, red oil, being uh, put on uh, some, let's say, picture. So, فَإِذًا شَقَّتِ السَّمَاءُ فَكَانَتْ وَرْضَةً تَبْدِهَانْ فَبِأَيِّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانْ So which of your Lord's favors do you deny? Do you know, this is another interesting thing, do you know what's the on average the color of the universe what's do you know what they uh, what is red eye okay I won't go into that right now let's have a case of time which of your Lord's favors do you deny on that day nor the jinn nor the human beings will be asked of their sins they're just going to be given their reckoning they're not going to be asked what sin did you do no you're not going to be asked what sin you do. You're going to be told what sin you did. And you'll be questioned about the sins that you did. Now, Allah is, this is in Surah Rahman, but there's only a few verses about the hellfire. But just to make sure that you understand Allah's mercy is not devoid of His justice. Allah's mercy is for the believers. Allah's justice is for the criminals. Allah's mercy is for the believers. His, mercy, His justice is for the people that have done wrong. So it doesn't mean that Allah is merciful that He's just going to let everything slide. No. Justice is there just as much as mercy is there. Mercy is for the believers. Justice is for the criminals. 
those who have opposed Allah and His Messenger and His Message. So which of your Lord's powers do you deny? That day, on the Day of Judgment, the criminals will be recognized by their faces. They will have marks on their faces, their gloom on their faces, the darkness on their faces, the bewilderment on their faces, the stare in their eyes. These are all mentioned in the Quran. Basaraka yawm al hadid. Today your, your eyesight is like iron, meaning they will be in this bewilderment because and this the philosophical aspects of this will be discussed in Sutul Waqia, where Allah says, where Allah discusses the the uh, the issue of being raised from dead, if it will happen or not happen. That's more discussed in the other surah. But this is just gonna give you a very beautiful uh, description of what is coming. On that day, the criminals will be recognized by their marks. Then, and the criminals, they will be gathered, they will be, took, take, the angels will grab them from their forelock and their feet. Forelock, for one reason, because forelock is where we think. By the way, this is where the cortex is. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned. Naziyatin kazibatin. The person whose forehead is lying, meaning his cortex, was deceiving him. This part of the brain is the one that makes the decisions, right or left. This is the decision-making part of the brain. So this is where your nasiya is. So, By the way, side point, some scholars of Islam based upon a hadith also, because you will be caught from your forelocks and because of your feet, some scholars have said it is not advisable to have hair hanging on your forehead also because we do sujood here so if you're on the, and the hair comes in the middle of your sujood it may be a issue in terms of your sajda uh, so it's better to keep hair uh, not on the especially women tend to do this a lot it's okay but it's, when they're praying and they cover their hair they should push their hair back rather than having the hair on the way of their it's a, it's a technical issue, it's a small issue, it's not a big issue. I'm only raising it because the eye is here. Jake, a uh, quick question. Um, is it that all believers uh, go to paradise, or is it that even if you sin, you'll go to hellfire for a little bit, and then you end up going to paradise eventually? Uh, how's that work? So let me uh, explain how that works. <coughs> there are, as far as the people who don't believe, there are two categories. Those people who, actually three categories. Those people who be, didn't believe, but they believed in some superpower. They believed in Allah. Who is the example of this in Quran? Who is the person, he didn't know about Allah, he didn't know about the messengers, he didn't have, know about Quran, Zubur, Torah, but Allah praises him in Quran. Who is it? Uthman. Uthman, by his wisdom, knew there, there is, there is someone there. Allah is there. So why he knows that Allah is there? Because his human nature is still intact. His fitrah is still salim al fitrah. He has good fitrah. He has good nature, good human nature. So because he has good human nature, he can see Allah. There must be some... You know, all of this is just not for, just for no reason. There must be something behind this. So Luqman realized, no, there is God. And the direct recognition of Allah exists as what? When you recognize there's a God, what's the next direct consequence of knowing that Allah exists? No, of course you believe in Him. You already believe in Him. But once you know Allah exists, what's the next logical conclusion? Worship. Huh? Worship. No, no. Okay, that, yes, but not from the perspective. The next logical conclusion is that there must be right and wrong. If you know Allah exists, then what? Then there has to be things that are right and things that are wrong. That's the logical conclusion. Anyway, I explained this from the Quran in, a, in another place. I might mention it today, but just keep this in mind. Those people who believe in Allah on the Day of Judgment, but they didn't know about Islam, or even if they knew about Islam, but they know what Fox News says. That's not learning about Islam. Right? So if he's a, a person says on the Day of Judgment, well, all I knew was what Fox News said, but he believes in Allah. He's sincere to Allah. Then he may be in like the people of Luqman Allah may have mercy on him. He has an excuse to Allah 
we and his excuse to Allah is an excuse against us, the Muslims. Because he will say, these people never told me. These people are never clarified to me the truth. Because he maybe would have accepted it. So that person who believes in Allah, and he shows up before Allah and his heart is clean. His heart is salim al-fitwa. He has an excuse before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a hadith of the Prophet 